So first of all, I think I went around and met almost all of you. For anybody I haven't met, my name is Dr. Kevin Feldman, but you can simply address me as Kevin. So what's my name? Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. I live in San Francisco, actually just outside of San Francisco. So when I saw, remember your first name, I know you just told me. Yeah. Doug walked in with orange and black on. I thought my daughter's at Oregon State, and I looked, I thought, no, but it's actually Oklahoma State, but OSU. Big Giants fan, so the Giants won last night. Um, so I'm very excited about that. But I'm even more excited about what we are doing here. Now, this is a little unusual, right? I mean, here we are. We're, we're sort of in what we call a, a fishbowl. This is not your regular classroom. We're obviously in the MIC. Um, and you, if you just look around the room and maybe just wave, you're going to see some faces that you know. Uh, anybody that you know, you can say, hey. Uh, and the people that you don't know, they're really great people, too. They're from other schools. Because let me take just 30 seconds and tell you what we're up to. We have a, a strong belief that teachers need to continually improve their teaching, so we figure out how to help you guys continue to improve your studenting. We'll make student a verb. Uh, raise your hand if you think it's a good idea that teachers improve their teaching. Students, yeah. Uh, teachers, raise your hand if you agree. Yeah, now there's many ways of improving. We can improve by reading things. We can improve by going back to college. Uh, but one of the most profound ways we've figured out we can improve is by watching each other teach. So you may have seen some of us in your classrooms this morning because we were in eight different classrooms. We got to rotate around, saw some incredible teaching with some marvelous teachers that you have here at Holt. You, you don't fully realize yet how lucky you guys are, but you're lucky. This is no school is perfect. Uh, Holt's uh, continuing to improve itself, but it's a really good school, and you're fortunate to be here because the teachers have embraced watching each other teach, talking about their teaching. I happen to come from California, so I'm a teacher from uh, the other end of the country, and I'm an old guy. So I've been doing this for a lot of years, 45 years. And so there might maybe some things that I do that might be helpful to some teachers. And you know what? There may be some things that I forget or I could have done differently, and they're going to give me feedback, and that's going to be helpful to me. So it's kind of like a win-win thing. So that's what we're up to, and we're videotaping it, not to put it on YouTube or to do anything goofy with it. We have a, protected, a password-protected website where we're sharing videos with each other so we can look outside of being at school at videos of each other teaching and send each other texts and emails as we critique and figure out what's working, what questions we have. So that's a really neat opportunity. So that's Sam back there. You want to say hi to Sam? Yes. Hey, Sam. Sam. Yeah. So that's what we are about. Now, what we want to do for the lesson is um, build on the reading you've been doing uh, in house on Mango Street, the house on Mango Street. First of all, raise your hand if, if you enjoyed reading the house on Mango Street. Raise your hand if you thought it was adequate. Raise your hand if you thought it kind of sucked. Yeah, great. And you know what? That's, that's perfect because that's what you're going to find in all kinds of literature. My son, who's now 24, uh, his name's Max. And they actually had this book when he was in high school uh, in California. And he was one of those that he didn't like it so much. Because when he was 16 years old or so, when he read it, you know, he referred to it as chick lit, meaning literature that maybe women like, maybe the girls like, but he didn't. He preferred uh, real life stories about war and battles and that kind of stuff. So different strokes for different folks. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're not talking about whether we liked it or not. We're talking about what can we learn from reading it, and not just reading the book, but thinking about implications of the life experience of the author that wrote the book. Because whether you like it or not, thought it was terrific, OK, or sucked is not the point. It raises issues that are well worth your thinking about. And one issue, and we call these issues themes, things that get us to think about stuff beyond the book that are really important. And one of them is this issue of gender roles. Would you say that phrase? Yeah. Gender roles. We all think we know what that means, but we're going to explore that a little bit this afternoon. And our goal is to add to our knowledge. I call this a learning target. At the end of our approximately 27 minutes together, the goal, if I do my job and you do your job, and I know we both will, the goal is, is to more fully understand the complexity of gender roles, where they come from, how they're different in different cultures, uh, how they change over time, how they've impacted us in our own families, how they've impacted our parents, how they've impacted every educator in here. Uh, it's complicated. And we're not going to unpack all of it, but we're going to look at a few of them that I think you'll find interesting. 
and provocative and maybe even worth your thinking. Um, so that's our learning target. Would you read it with me, please? Everybody, right up here. To more fully understand Yeah, and how they are formed. So first of all, let's think about this. Is there a difference between sex and gender? Just stop and think about that. Why don't you think about that? Don't talk, just think. Between sex and gender, are they the same? Are they different? If they're different, how are they different? If they're the same, why do you think that? And first of all, just weigh in. So you have to vote one way or the other. So first, we're going to go for the same. Raise your hand if you think they're basically different words for the same thing. Fabulous. Thank you. Raise your hand if you think there might be some differences. Wonderful. Um, and what we're going to do is unpack because we find many people use these terms interchangeably. That's what we call a college word. Would you say that, everybody, interchangeably? interchangeably. Yeah, yeah. Interchangeably, of course, means we can use them synonymously. One, we can interchange with the other. But when you talk to sociobiologists, when you talk to demographers, people that study sociology, how people live together, how people grow and change in different cultures, they argue they're distinct. Distinct as in different. And so what I want to do is make sure that you understand what these distinctions are, because that'll be the first new thing we might learn about gender and gender roles. So sex refers to biological characteristics with which we are born. Such characteristics determine if we have male or female genitalia, among other things. For example, genetically, some of us have um, an X and a Y chromosome. Raise your hand if you have a Y chromosome. Males, raise your hand. Y chromosome, good. Raise your hand if you are a double X. Girls, raise your hand. That's a difference, OK? That's what we mean by biological. That was not influenced by culture not influenced by where you lived, what part of the country, or what era you were born in. That's a biological difference. So would, would you please just note, we're just going to take some summary notes. Would you just put, don't copy this. Don't want to do that. We want to have a little abbreviated reminder. Just put some like, and you don't have to put exactly what I say. Let me think out loud. So I'm not going to write this whole thing. I think the main thing to remember is sex equals biological. Maybe just put that. Maybe you might want to put that little XXXY thing to remind you as an example. You don't have to. Anything that reminds you that the term, what is your sex, refers to biological distinctions that are not driven by culture. So these will just be little sort of reminder notes that we can look back at should we choose to review things and remind us of what we are learning. Um, gender is a little more fluid. Fluid's a fancy word for it's iffy, it's sticky, it's messy, it's hard to pin down. But the key thing is it's learned attitudes and behaviors that characterize people as men and women. And this is very subject to culture, where you were born, very subject to who your family is, very subject to when you were born. It's different for you than for your grandparents, very different. Uh, your grandparents and your great-grandparents, for example, if they're female, they didn't get to vote, or they got the vote in their lifetime. When we look at that now, we think, what? We use gender to determine whether or not you could vote? But that was a role. It was not viewed as appropriate for women to bother themselves with the messiness of politics. Now we look at that, and well, maybe we're going to vote for Hillary Clinton for president. Who knows? But times have changed. So gender is more fluid. So you might just want to note gender and then equals learned. So it just reminds you that sex is biological, gender, the way most scientists use it. And so we're talking now about scientific definitions. I would agree with those of you that raised your hand when you said same. I think often in general conversation, we treat them the same. What gender, we mean what sex. But when you read scientific information at a, at a scientific website, they don't mean that. They are more precise in their language. OK, so then we talk gender roles. What we mean here is how does this play out? So gender roles are the characteristics, attitudes, feelings, behaviors that society expects of males and females. So gender role, I would argue, just put expectation, social expectation. What do we expect girls to do? Should girls play with guns or girls play with dolls? Should girls wear pink? 
Should girls wear whatever color they want? Should girls play? When I was a young guy, I told you I'm an old guy. When I was a young guy, uh, I remember as a young teacher, there's a famous, in fact, she's a sportscaster. You may occasionally see her. Her name is Cheryl Miller. Well, I got to coach Cheryl and her brother, Reggie. He was an all-star, in fact, one of the best three-point shooters in the history of the NBA. Played for years and years and years for Indianapolis. Well, I got to coach them in elementary school. I'd like to say I taught them everything they knew, but I didn't teach them anything. This is elementary school. You know, four grades, four, five, six, you're all on the basketball team. Is, but everybody said about Cheryl, they would always say, man, look at this girl. She's the best. Well, we had a flag football team. They had never had a girl play flag football. This is about 1972. And her family had to petition the school board with the threat of a lawsuit. And her family didn't want to mess with. Uh, dad was a lawyer, mom was a doctor, uh, a, a medical doctor, and they went to the school board, to the superintendent, and said, our daughter's going to play football. We can do it the easy way or the hard way. Easy way is you change the rules and let her play. Hard way is I'm filing a lawsuit tomorrow. What will it be? That's basically a paraphrase, or at least that's the, what people say. Who knows what actually happened? It's behind closed doors. But what's the point? The gender role then was expectation. Girls play football, and of course, she was the best player on our team. In fact, our number one play, we only had three plays. Number one play was Cheryl Go Long. Um, and so you'll still see her often as a commentator. She's a very attractive African-American woman, probably now in her early 40s. Cheryl Miller, look for her. She's really yeah. awesome. But she's a good example of that the expectations are changing. So raise your hand if you think, well, rather than that, with your partner, just briefly touch base. If, if you were explaining to um, a friend the difference between sex, gender, and gender roles, how would you do that? So let's start with uh, boys. If you have a, a boy, girl, if you're the same sex, not gender, uh, then um, say whoever has the longest hair would you start. So you start, maybe you take sex, the next one takes gender, and you both take gender roles. OK, have at it. How would you explain it? What would you say? You guys got that. That was easy. Wrap it up. Fabulous. So just our, our little notes, we have our crib sheet. So the first one said, well, I'd say sex is biological. So would I. And then somebody said, well, gender, that's learned. That's the behaviors and attitudes. And gender roles, they said, that's the expec. Everybody? Expectations. Yeah, the expectations that others have of how should I act as a male or a female, as a boy or a girl, as a man or a woman. Raise your hand if those differences make some kind of sense to you. Good. OK, then we can move on. Um, so where do we learn these things? Where do we learn how to be a boy or a, a girl? Some things are biologically built in, and people are still arguing the research about how built in this is. And it appears to vary a lot. We haven't figured it out. Some things are clearly learned. Of those things that are learned in our gender roles, where do we learn? Just stop and think for a minute. We'll get to talk in a moment. Where do we learn our gender roles? Think in your own life. Think in your family. Think your mom and dad, friends. Where do we learn gender roles? Think about House on Mango Street. Where was Esperanza learning her gender roles? Was that similar or different from her brothers? Carlos and what was the brother? Kiki, yes, thank you. I got a little hint from the teacher, which I appreciate. Yes, Carlos and Kiki, um, who are minor characters in the book, but she refers to them. All right, this time, uh, let's start with um, how about the person that has on the brightest top? Figure out who that is. I want you to weigh in first. There's those right answers here, so don't worry about being right. Just say, well, I'm not sure, but I think you learn them from, and then Say, where do you think we learn gender roles? In a group of three, make sure all three have an opportunity to talk. OK, tell your partner, what do you think? Where do we learn it? Uh, okay. 
Okay, let's come together. Let's see if we can get a few from you guys, and then I'll do the wrap up. So, Michigan, remind me of your first name? John. Nice public voice. When you use the term gender role in your answer, so you can say something like, Oh, I think one area where we learn gender roles is, and then you might say television, or you might say advertising, or whatever. Go ahead. Complete sentence. I think. I think that we learn gender roles from like society and families and other people. Wonderful. Society, family, and other people. Let's give it up. That was pretty darn good. Yes. Thank you very, very much. And we want to have gender equality or sex equality. Tell me your first name, ma'am. Ashley. And how about um, building on what we heard from John, right? Thanks. So once again, a complete sentence. And maybe use um, in addition. So in addition, we learn gender roles from and add something new. Give it a go, Ashley. Um, in addition, we learn gender roles from like, what we get like, as a child, I guess, like our parents' lives. Ooh, very good. Did everybody hear that over there? One more time. That's a really good, but so good. I'm going to move over here. So talk to me over here, but in a nice, loud, what we call a public voice. Because it's so good, I don't want anybody to miss it. Ashley, have that again, just to say exactly what you said. Um, I said, in addition, we learn gender roles from like, the things that our parents like, buy us as a child. Wonderful. Like? Um, like, if your parents bought you a doll. Wonderful, yeah. Toys and clothes and, yeah, many other things. You don't need to write this down, but just be thinking about what was true for you as a kid, your siblings, friends. So research indicates, and we heard this from John, families are one primary way that we learn gender roles. Boy, you can sure see that with Esperanza and her family. In fact, she was rebelling against that big time in the book because you could tell she felt trapped by the expectations of uh, particularly being a Latina. Uh, and we find, yes, culture has a big impact. And she happens to be from Mexico. And there's certain expectations that are very different than, say, for women who were born here in Michigan that are, that are not Latino. So families are our first teachers. Now we're just going to buzz through these others because we don't want to take too much time here. But certainly school, we learn in school. We learn from uh, uh, our peers, other teachers, popular culture, media, advertising. Uh, certainly, we learn them from things that our parents buy us. Uh, absolutely. So there's many, 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 many sources. And these sources differ from culture to culture. Boys are not boys in the same gender role in every culture. They are very, very different. And what's important to understand is that these roles are learned that they are something that happens, that we experience these expectations growing up. Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like you to think briefly about your own extended family and think, what kind of gender roles do you see in your own ex extended family? Were, were you the kind of kid like Cheryl and said, I want to play football. I don't care if there's no other girls playing it. I want to play. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it's different. At least it was different then. You'll see some girls that want to go out for the wrestling team. You'll see girls now that are in combat missions in the military. Just a few years ago, couldn't do that. So gender roles are changing and shifting all the time. When I was young, we didn't have any female police officers. Now that's very common. So think about your own family. And I'd like you to, once again, get with your partner and just weigh in. What do you see in your own experience? What did you learn? What messages did you get as a youngster? And again, these are not good or bad. But were you the kind of kid that was happy playing with dolls? Like, I know my daughter. She loved playing with dolls, but she also wanted to play cowboys and Indians. And she wanted to play guns with her older brother. Whereas my older brother, he wasn't into the doll part. But we were going to be politically correct. No guns in our family. Well, I, I saw when he was like 18 months old, he would pick up a stick and go, cuckoo, daddy, I got you. So he was playing with guns whether I wanted him to play with guns or not. Gosh, where did he learn that? I don't know. Maybe from older kids, maybe from TV. Not from me, I'd like to think, but I don't know. So we learn these roles all over the place. 
go ahead and give with your partner, talk about your own experience. What kind of messages did you get about expectations about being a boy or being a girl? Any similarities and differences with Esperanza? Did you feel trapped by that? Okay, talk it over. <laughs> Okay, guys, thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate the conversation. Now, this leads to, as you guys go on, you go to college, you read more scientific material, this is a question that haunts researchers as long as we've been studying biology, sociology, psychology, and that is, are gender roles primarily caused by the biology part, or are they primarily caused by culture, social learning part? And people are arguing that because definitely the genetic part, the sex part, appears to have some impact on males and females. But by the same token, we know learning is, which do you think is most influential? The nature, that would be biology, or the nurture, that would be social, that would be learned from other people. And again, I want to tell you right up front, there's no right answer here. Science can't answer this one. We've tried. It's complicated. Uh, but I'm just curious, in your own life, do you think that gender roles are primarily biological? That's the way you, know, you are. You can change a little bit. Or do you think it's primarily learned? And why do you think that? So please weigh in briefly with your partner. I don't care who goes first, as long as you both speak. OK, have at it. What do you think? I like this graphic. I found it, of course, on Google Images. But isn't that a cool graphic? Take a look at that for a moment. What are they trying to portray in that graphic? Just take a look. What's that thing in the middle? Have you encountered that in biology? DNA. Ooh, very good, DNA. And what do we call that, that wiggly thing in the middle, that spiral? What do you call that? The double what? Everybody? Double helix. It's the what? Double yeah. Yes, that would make James Watson and Francis Crick and their um, offspring very happy that you remembered they just discovered that in my lifetime. <laughs> Fairly new, the structure of DNA. And how much of that is accountable for gender role and how much is social learning? As I was going around, raise your hand if you think it was, it's primarily social learning. Raise your hand if you think it's primarily biological. Yeah, OK, that's fine. And you know the jury's out. Uh, that was my quick check was most of us thought that it was primarily social. Um, we do not know. But here are some things that we do know. And I'd just like you to think about these. We know that there are some sex-related genetic differences, like that Y chromosome. That we know for sure. We also know that cross-culturally, when we study men and women in other cultures, that there are some characteristics deem male in one culture who are definitely not male in another. So that would tell us that a lot of gender roles are what? Starts with an L. Ends with, rhymes with spurned. Learned. Learned. They're what, everybody? Learned. Learned. Everybody? Learned. Learned. Yeah, now you guys get a little weak on me here. They're, they're learned, yeah. And lastly, this nature and nurture interact. And that's all we can say for certainty right now. That's why I like this graphic, is it shows us that it's an interaction between the nature and the nurture. So what I'd like you to put in your notes is would you just simply put nature, nurture, interact. That means they both contribute. And how much, we can't say. We just haven't figured it out, and we may never figure it out. It right now has defied research to really figure it out. So just nature and nurture interact. So we have just a little quick summary before we have to wrap up here in a few minutes of what have we concluded? What have we learned about gender roles, gender, sex? And how do we see many of these things raised and playing out in the novel you just read? So if you just look, for example, at chapter 3, here's a pretty strong statement. Let me read it. You reflect on it. This is Esperanza speaking now. So this is her voice. She's saying, the boys and girls live in separate worlds, the boys in their universe and we in ours. Pretty strong language. And when we look, 
what do you think Esperanza is getting at here? What's her message? And do you think she means literally separate worlds, different worlds, or is this a metaphor? If it's a metaphor, what might be a metaphor of? Remember, a metaphor is a symbol that represents something else where they're not explicitly saying it, but they really mean it. And here again, don't worry about being right, just kind of speculate. What do you think she's getting at here? And if, if this different worlds, right, um, this separate universe, right, um, she doesn't mean that literally, she's speaking figuratively. Would you say that word figuratively? Figuratively, yeah, that's using language like metaphor and simile uh, and other symbols to communicate an idea, as I know you've been learning in English language arts. Okay, so please weigh in quickly. What does Esperanza mean? And if it is a metaphor, what might it be representing? What's she really saying here when she says different worlds? Is she saying it's not unfair? Is she saying there's sexual discrimination? Well, what's she saying with different worlds? Okay, talk it over. What do you think? What's she saying here? means it figuratively. Let's go for literal first. Do you think she really means separate world? Do you think she means figuratively separate world? Yeah. And we could talk about metaphor for, and I heard a number of you say things like social status, uh, metaphor for gender discrimination. Uh, she was very upset by the fact of that her brothers treated her one way at home and another way out in the community, uh, and that she wanted to break free of that. Remember, she felt tethered. Well, there's all kinds of other things we could talk about here. In what ways, and you might want to discuss these later if you haven't already, in what ways do you see this is true or not true uh, in the country as a whole, in Michigan in particular, uh, in internationally, in other countries? And how has this changed? Have a conversation with your mom, your dad, your grandma, if you're lucky enough to still have your grandparents alive, of what was it like in terms of gender expectations, gender roles when they were kids. I think you'll find it really interesting. Um, and how this is changing, right, for Latinos. And it's changing, I just got back from India, and India gender roles used to be very strict, and they're still pretty strict, but it's changing. Things are bubbling. Some people think it's good, some people think it's very bad. I hear a lot in the paper about cultures from the Middle East. Some cultures where women have to wear black. Some cultures where women, when they go in public, and I saw this in India, have to wear a burqa. Well, all you see is their eyes, and they're walking along in black, and all you can see is their eyes. Some people think, oh, that's just a cultural difference. Other people say, no, that's a symbol for a cultural prison. They don't have any choice. That's what they have to do. So this is a thing that in your lifetime, you're going to see lots of ferment, lots of things bubbling and changing. I want to leave you with, um, we're going to skip over this, although it's interesting. There's something called the Global Gender Gap Index. And groups of researchers have been looking at women's rights, women's opportunity across the world. And until I got the opportunity to prepare for this lesson, I had no idea there was such a thing. Um, and I'd like you to, so it's a composite indicator. What do they do? They take things like education. They take things like legal status. They th take things like uh, how much you earn for doing the same job, uh, job opportunities. They put those into a composite. Would you say that word composite? Composite. A composite indicator is you take multiple indicators and put them together. It's a composite. And here's what they have found. Now, I realize it's a little washed out here, but these 10 are the 10 lowest in terms of human rights for women in the world. 
uh, the ones that are, as you can see, the top 10, right, are right here. We're not in the top 10. Top 10 are right around here, like Norway, Sweden, Scandinavia, uh, Spain, France. Um, now, we're, oops, we are actually high, so that's pretty good, right? You can see Argentina here. Uh, you can see Colombia here. Uh, and it's interesting, as we look, you see Australia over there pretty high, that this map is changing. If you were to look at this map 100 years ago, you would see very little green, very little red, and lots and lots of yellow and that dark red and blue. So this game is changing, this gender roles thing all over the world. And so here's what I'd like to leave you with is briefly reflecting on this. Our learning target for our brief lesson today was to more fully understand the complexities, the things that go into gender roles and how gender is different from sex. Uh, and how it's biology and um, um, what we learn. And I'd like you to think of one thing in the last half hour that you've learned about gender roles. For example, you could simply say sex and gender are not the same thing. And that would be fine. But see if you can think of something else also. It's one thing from our little half hour lesson on gender roles. So stop and think. Everybody just stop and think. Wonderful. And what I'd like you to do is just turn to a partner and say, one thing I think I've learned about gender roles is, and whatever it is. And you can use mine or think of another one. Have at it. One thing I've learned is basically that sex and gender are different in the ways that people look at them, with the, like, the way that sex is to What's one? Hi. <laughs> Have at it. I said that I learned that uh, sex and gender are different. I learned uh, that sex is actually more biological. OK. Anything else you would add? Well, um, nothing that I learned, because I've like, listened to this a little Oh, good, like, good. Yeah. OK, so it reaffirmed yes. things that yes. you already know? And I'm glad you're teaching people this. Yeah. A lot of people make that confusion. Right. Had you ever seen that map or anything like no, it? I that was pretty cool. Oh, see, that's something you learned <laughs> about the composite index for the global gender gap. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, guys. We got to wrap it up here. First of all, fellow teachers, would you please give it up for the students? Yeah, yes. Um, in terms of the learning, I heard people talk about sex and gender. I also heard people talk about the global gender gap. They hadn't thought about that. So I'm very delighted that your minds are open to continued learning. That's a very good attitude. Would you go ahead and put your stickies, if you have your notebooks with you, uh, in your notebooks so you can refer to those later as you need to.